Hello. When I was in sixth grade, I, start over, second chance. When I was in sixth grade, my class put on a performance for the school. It was a melodrama. And there was this sweet and beautiful and innocent young girl who I had a secret crush on, who got typecast to play the sweet and innocent and beautiful young girl in the, in the melodrama, the one that gets tied up to the railroad tracks. And I wanted to play Dudley Do-Right. I wanted to be the one that sweeps in at the last minute and saves her and whisks her away to some happy future as the music swells. I got cast as Dastardly Dick. <laughs> I don't know what that teacher saw in me, but fast forward a few years, by the middle of high school, man, I was playing that part. I was Dastardly Dick. I was the, the adolescent kid who was totally enthralled to his adolescent appetites. Get drunk, get high, get laid, that was it. And I still, the, the girl is still in the picture. She sat, I sat next to her junior year in trig class and I was the guy that came in every day and did this stupid little adolescent trick where I'd reach over and check to see if she shaved her legs that day. I just rub my hand up her calf and go like, ouch! And everybody laughed and she's embarrassed and more importantly, I got to touch her leg. And she was still sweet and beautiful and innocent and by this point she also had something else that I was quite interested in at the time, cleavage. And right in the middle of it, hung this golden cross, which was the only thing that kept Dastardly Dick at bay. Which was good, because we were friends. We were friends, I mean, we'd grown up together. We were in this tight-knit group of friends that went through middle school and high school together. We always saw each other in, in a group, and we gave each other that friend's hug, you know, two seconds, just two seconds, no longer, it means something. And, and then it's like, mm, see you later. Midway through college, I ran into her again, and she flipped the script with three little words. She said, I'm getting married. Yeah. I, uh, I was a complete frat hole by this time. Uh, <laughs> Dastardly Dick was running the show. Uh, and I was indulging a certain specifically Southern California young male adolescent cynicism. I was like, she got her Dudley Do-Right? She's riding off into the sunset? Good luck with that. I, we, were, we grew up in Southern California, 45 minutes from Hollywood. I knew the stories. I knew how it looked on the silver screen, right? Boy meets girl, they fall in love, maybe they grew up together. They run off and get married and live out their lives happily ever after in some imagined utopia like Boulder, Colorado or something. <laughs> this was reality. Reality for me was bleach blondes and real estate agents. Reality was my parents' divorce from the time that I was a little guy that lasted for years, which was nothing but lies and cheating and extramarital sex and a whole lot of tears in the night. Good luck with the fairy tale. I went up to Lone Tree Rock that night and literally howled at the moon. So I kept up the dastardly dick routine for another, hour, another year and a half after that. And then finally things shifted for me. Finally I decided maybe I need to flip the script. Maybe I need to try some honesty. I had a new girlfriend and things were getting serious. And I had cheated on her early in the relationship and I decided maybe if I could confess that, we could have a clean slate. If we could survive that confession, we could have a, a solid foundation on which to build. We didn't survive that confession. In fact, I almost didn't survive that confession. I, as I was confessing to her that I had cheated on her, I began, I was confessing that I had cheated on every girlfriend I'd had, that I had lied to everyone that I knew, that I used people, that I was, in my deepest self, a dastardly dick. This was my midlife crisis at age 21. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I walked around catatonic for weeks after that. I, uh, I, I couldn't function. It took me months working with a counselor to start to have normal conversations again. Um, I, it dragged into years. I was trying to believe that I could be that guy, the guy that I wanted to be, that I could do right. And then, about two years into this process, the heroine reemerges. She, the girl, the girl that I grew up with, a friend said, said, hey, guess who I ran into? Angela Beloyan. And I said, no, 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 she's married now, right? She's gonna be Angela do right. He said, no, 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 I, I don't think so. <laughs> she said, no, they called it off. I said, let's go see her now. So we went and saw her, we reconnected, and we, we saw each other every couple of months after that, and then we became pen pals in between. We'd write letters to each other, and then this one night, one night, she was back in town just for one night, and she 
and was over at Micah's house, our friends, and the whole gang was together again, and we hung out, and it was great. It was fantastic. And then she had to leave first thing in the morning, and we left Micah's, and I said goodbye. And she pulled out in her little green Datsun, and she pulled left on Alessandra Boulevard to go to her mom's house, and I pulled right to go to my mom's house. And I looked back, and I said, no, no. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I hung the quickest U-turn I could, and I start racing down Alessandro Boulevard. It's this wide, windy boulevard in Southern California, palm tree lined, and I'm thinking, great, I'm in a movie. I'm racing this down. What am I going to do, catch her at the end and like whisk her out of the car and into my arms and the music will swell? I didn't care. I just needed to see her for two more minutes. I knew it wasn't going to be that, but what the hell? And so I'm racing down, and there she is at the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the hill, and, and she goes through the intersection, and the light turns yellow, and then it turns red, and I don't care. I go racing through because it's Southern California anyway. And I go racing through, and I catch up to her, and I'm honking the horn, and I'm, I'm flashing the lights, and she pulls over into this little church parking lot, and she, yes, and she gets out, and she's leaning against, she, she gets out with that smile, that smile that she has, and that laugh that makes me feel like Jesus and Willy Wonka had a baby and it's throwing confetti at my heart. And I said... And she says, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I just need to see you again just for a minute. Is that Okay. And we sat there. We stood there just leaning against our cars and looking up at the stars for another two hours. And finally, I turned to her and I said, do you really have to leave first thing in the morning? And she looked at me and she said, yes. And I said, would you come over to my mom's house in the morning and let me cook you breakfast before you go? And she said, yes. And I leaned down to give her that friend's hug good night. And at the end of two seconds, man, the music must have swelled because she did not let go. Woo!